So kind of the focus for the next um, hour and 15 minutes or so is really around training and risk management. We've got this topic broken up into to kind of two sections. We've got a couple of presenters um, who are going to talk about the, the different programs that they are associated with. Um, we'll have time for, for questions after each one of those presentations. And then after the lunch break, we're actually going to go into breakout groups to, to dig into these topics a little bit more. Um, but yeah, kind of putting putting on that, that um, risk management hat currently and, and thinking about how you handle that within your program and lessons that we can kind of learn across the board or, or be more effective at addressing some of the safety issues that we're seeing in the winter backcountry. Um, so first up, we have uh, Liz from ARI, who's going to talk to us a little bit just about the trends that they are seeing um, from the avalanche education perspective. And, you know, I think anecdotally, we all know that there are more new people, especially getting out into the backcountry with the resort restrictions and, and closures. Um, and yeah, hopefully Liz can tell us a little bit more about what they're seeing um, on the education side. Awesome. Thanks so much, Julie, and thanks for having me here today. Um, let me get my screen sharing. Can everyone see that okay? Looks great. Lovely. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to give a really quick um, little bit about kind of the state of avalanche education this season, and I think um, I probably don't have much else to add other than to confirm sort of what we've been hearing anecdotally is that there's just a ton of people um, in the backcountry across the Western US this year. Um, so I'll give a little bit about the state of avalanche education, at least from Aries perspective, um, how you can help people or you yourself can find high quality education and um, some talking points maybe that you can use about avalanche awareness and education when you're interacting with your members or with the public. Um, so I just want to real quick take a second to talk about ARI, um, who the, for those who might be familiar with um, ARI, but maybe not our model. Um, we're a 501c3 nonprofit organization, um, and we help a network of over 110 uh, recreational avalanche course providers provide high quality avalanche education, and we do that through providing them regularly updated research-based curriculum, and then training instructors to teach that curriculum. So we don't actually directly offer recreational avalanche courses, but we do train professionals. So I'm kind of speaking from that perspective of what we are seeing as um, trainers and developers of avalanche instructors and develop, developers of curriculum. Um, so as we've been talking about, um, there's more people than ever getting into the backcountry. Um, we've been hearing this anecdotally from providers, um, what they're seeing at trailheads, um, what our staff has been seeing with super crowded parking lots and kind of a continuation of a lot of things that we saw this summer. I think um, somebody was probably repeating somebody else, but they summed it up well when they said, especially in the major, the areas around major metro areas that the um, weekdays are like weekends and weekends are like holidays. Um, so we're seeing a lot of New people, um, I've been personally just seeing a lot of like pretty big meetup style groups with a lot of very, very shiny brand new equipment. So either people got use their um, stimulus checks to buy equipment or a lot of people are getting um, into the backcountry or maybe, maybe it's a mix of both. Um, and so yeah, it just matches what we've been seeing over the summer. Personally at ARI as well, we've been getting a lot of um, requests for interviews and just in general, we've been seeing a lot of chatter about it in magazines and podcasts. And um, I mean, my litmus is when my seven-year-old father from Nebraska is sending me stuff about backcountry skiing and saying like, oh, did you see these articles? So it's like even reaching the Omaha World Herald, um, which I think just sort of speaks to the reach of this, um, of this sport. So that with that then comes an enormous demand for avalanche education. Again, anecdotally, um, just on what, what we've been seeing posted from our providers and then the reports that we've been getting from our, from our providers, they've been saying that their December, January, and February courses were full in like October or November. Um, and so then they've started adding midweek courses and those are filling. I just had a provider in California tell me that three separate people on her wait list offered to pay cash in full for the course 
in order to hold their spot to basically cut the line, <laughs> cut the waitlist line. So not only are the courses full, the waitlists are long, and then people are like coming up with all sorts of creative ways to jockey and get in front. So that's, we've been just seeing a ton of demand. Um, just to put that in per, like numbers perspective then. So last year, despite the six week um, early shutdown, I mean, basically we lost six weeks of that one education system or season because of um, stay at home orders due to COVID, we still had nearly 12,000 students. So this would be across the Western US and kind of the mountain New England area. Um, 12,000 students take a course. And this year we're already on track to see a 25% increase over that. So, so really big numbers. Um, and then also demand far exceeds supply. And I'll get to this in a minute, then talking about high quality avalanche education, but anytime that you have um, an unmet need, because we're Americans and we're resourceful and entrepreneurial, people rise to the occasion to meet that need. And so we've been seeing that happen in very mixed ways. So there's a proliferation and probably like all online courses, um, people who are professionals who, and I don't wanna make commentary about whether they're qualified or not qualified, but just saying like, this is, there's a lot of demand, I can get into this. And so a lot of our outreach this year has been around making sure that people are coming away um, adequately educated and equipped with tools to actually manage their risk instead of just a lot of information about avalanches. Um, and so in, in the ski and snowboard world, I think this is driven a lot by that messaging around getting education is out there. So a lot of people view it as like, I needed my beacon shovel probe and then I need to take an avalanche course. And so that's really what's driving a lot of that demand. We've been seeing sort of mixed, um, mixed, what was, is, there's a lot of opportunities, I think, to meet some of those outside of ski and snowboard communities, especially in the motorized snowshoe and climbing world. Um, so some of it is like that demand has increased and there wasn't really a pool to draw from. So there's a lot of opportunities to better serve that community, both in getting them the education that they want um, in order to interact with Avalanche Train. And then also there's a whole new subset of brand new travelers who took up camping and hiking over the summer. And because there's nothing else to do, there's no football, there's no, con well, I mean, there's football, but there's, it's not the same. <laughs> there's no concerts. So there's just like not a lot to do in the winter. I live here in Seattle, like you need something to do. It rains a lot. And so you used to just see a ton of people going outside who were hiking over the summer. And now they're saying, well, I just rent a pair of snowshoes or buy a pair of snowshoes and then I keep doing it. So they're not even aware that the hazard exists. So there's kind of two tiers of messaging and outreach and communication that we're looking for there in terms of better serving those communities. So this is a really good um, segue then to talking points around high quality av avalanche education. And I think that's really become the focus of our outreach this year. Um, so and the messaging around that has been just as you invest in high quality rescue equipment, like you wouldn't buy um, a second, a factory seconds beacon on eBay or wherever you get those things. Um, you similarly aren't going to go with like Joe's um, nighttime online avalanche school. Like you need to invest that same sort of discrimination and resource into avalanche education. And so really awareness that courses are wonderful and they kind of fill a whole spectrum of like just being aware of the danger to like a little bit of preview about what avalanche train is or how to use um, forecast products, but they're really directed at kind of an awareness that there is potential danger in the winter mountains. Um, and so really, if you're planning to travel in the winter mountains, you need a course um, that spends time looking at avalanche terrain teaches you a risk management process and gives you tools to continue your learning because you can't, it's such a complex thing. You can't learn everything you need to know in three days. You need a process to manage your risk while you continue to build your experience. It shouldn't be just a three day fire hose of about learning about avalanches and like kind of wow and awe with snow pits. Like you should feel like you come away with tools and that's really the outreach message that we've been 
giving to folks. Um, so at a minimum, the American Avalanche Association, which is the professional organization for um, avalanche professionals to include like ski patrollers, forecasters, highway workers, and guides and avalanche educators, um, set like a real set a minimum requirement for what that level one course should be. Um, and you can find courses that meet those minimum requirements on avalanche.org. And at the end of this presentation, I'll have a couple of resources that you can share. And Julie, I'll share this presentation with you. So you have some links to those. But at a minimum, it should be a 24 hour or equivalent course. So a lot of that this year is being met by um, some asynchronous or self-paced online learning. So ARI, for example, has, um, it's actually probably about 20 hours of online learning um, to supplement what is probably like a two to three hour Zoom session coupled with two days in the field. But it's really key that 60% of that 24 hours of instruction is actually spent in the field, looking at terrain, touching snow, moving through terrain. Um, and as I, I'm gonna keep hammering home that really you need to come away with a risk management process. So just as you have a beacon shovel and probe, you should come away with a tangible tool and that is a risk management. Process. I encourage folks to do that this is challenging because of availability. Liz, I don't know if you can hear me. I think we're losing you a little bit. Um, is it should be, this is not my preferred 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 mode of travel or um, this is you know you, we only hear so that they are looking at terrain the same way that you're looking at terrain, um, taking it from somebody who's a motorized traveler so that again you're moving on the mode that you're gonna go into the mountains with, and you're not having to do that extra layer of like context changing after the fact. So it's worth it to call up a provider and ask them and ask who's teaching their course and what do they learn on the course, especially if they're um, not an area provider and you don't have as open access to preview their curriculum. Um, so then just to recap all of this, when I'm giving kind of outreach talking points, um, I use the know before you go, which is kind of the American sort of um, national agreed upon um, awareness talking points is to get the gear. You need a beacon shovel probe and a communication device, get the forecast. Um, and then you need to get the training. And that involves, that's not just a go learn some things. You need to know how to use your gear. So that's that you're proficient with rescue. You need to know how to use the info in the forecast. It's a, they are very robust and wonderful resources. And you wanna make sure that you're using that to its fullest extent. Um, and then using that information, you'll learn how to manage your risk and how to manage, how to continue your learning. So those are really like the talking points. I try to keep it to the get the, there's two other points to the get the, but I find personally that people can remember three things. And so I just stick to the three things and then kind of add some talking points breaking my own rule and I put four things below to get the training. Um, but those are, I try to keep it simple and then that aligns with messaging when I send them through these next resources. So that is pretty much, I always tell people to start at avalanche.org because they're gonna get both educational resources and it's the quickest way to find their local avalanche center if they don't um, you know, have that bookmarked already. KBYG.org is knowbeforeyougo.org, and that's where that clearinghouse of that awareness messaging, in addition to a really awesome um, online awareness module that you can go through to get some more information. And then finally, um, avtraining.org is Aries' website, and you can go there to find a course um, or course providers. And then I also linked two resources to our online learning this year, which for this season is freely available to everyone, um, just kind of as a community resource to support both our providers and for folks who want to refresh their avalanche education. So real short, I 
like to, I picked those two because they're pretty easy to remember and you can just tell somebody to go to that website without having to have a long list to give them. And from there, it'll link to most other things that they might need to know. So that's all I have, just kind of a quick, here's what's going on from Mary's perspective and hopefully some talking points um, that you can give when talking to, to your members. That's great, Liz. Thanks so much for that info. Um, I've got a couple of questions then if folks wanna start putting questions into the chat, um, you can go ahead and do that. Um, one, you'd mentioned it, you know, just kind of 25% increase in the overall number of, of people signing up for, for classes. Do you have a sense for, is the majority of that coming from people who are doing level one courses? Like they're, they're new people mainly, or is, are you seeing kind of across the board, everybody's kind of leveling up or taking, taking the next step? This is um, mostly anecdotally, I've been hearing that it's area one or level one courses. So people haven't been seeing the same increase in their rescue and especially the level two courses. So um, we can infer again, that means that it's a lot of new folks in there. Cool, great. Um, and then, you know, I just, I, I just took a level two um, this year and it'd been a while since I had done the level one and, and the structure has changed right in the last mm -hmm. couple of years. Um, so I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit to the kind of the rationale behind that change and what you know if you've seen good feedback from participants or yeah what, if you've seen the learning outcomes um, improve with that change. Yeah so specifically um, at at Erie, there, well, there was a couple things that are going on. For one, the industry recognized that the needs of recreational travelers and the needs of professionals are different. They operate in two different contexts. Um, I would argue that recreational travelers have a, a more challenging job because you're doing it with your friends or family, which is always harder. Um, you're doing it on your day off, and then you don't necessarily have the support of an operation that a pro, um, professional would have. But really that there is a recognition that there are two different training needs. And then from that area, use that as an opportunity to incorporate, incorporate a lot of feedback that we've been getting about, you know, if you took an area course a long time ago, we used the decision-making framework, which um, was elegant, but confusing. I think it was like one of those things that after the fact, you sort of look at it once you're kind of immersed in the Kool-Aid, so to speak, and you're like, this is, this is awesome. This really makes sense. And then the first time you look at it, it's like, that thing's a circle, it's completely unapproachable. <laughs> like I just eddy out in the circle and I don't know how to get out and choose terrain. Um, and so we took that feedback and said, great, what we need to give people is a concrete tool. We need to give them a risk management process that's repeatable and scales with them. So it works when you're brand new, you know, you're basically all you're doing is pre-trip hazard identification, creating a plan or response and then checking, maintaining situational awareness once you're out in the field and then reviewing that process and then just repeating it. And so really that terrain choice when you're new to all of this is gonna be, have really, really big margins on it. So the analogy I use is like, you have an 18 inch paint bowler and you're just eliminating like all of this. You're like, I'm just gonna stay in this like very shallow ridge today. <clears throat> and then as you gain experience, using that process and you have more um, experience to draw from, then maybe the size of your paintbrush in which you're ruling out terrain gets smaller. And so then you're down to like, you know, a two inch corner brush or something. And you're saying, I'm not gonna go on this slope and I'm not gonna go on this slope, but then we'll sort of assess this area in between. Um, so we really were, the, the shift was to give people a tool that grows with them and something that's a concrete, action you can perform, but again, moving away from like just things that you should know. Awesome. Um, and then, oh, one other question that popped into my head, um, and certainly folks feel free to, to throw stuff in the chat. Um, you know, I, I think as we've been seeing, particularly in Colorado this year, we've got a really funky snowpack and really high AVI danger. And we've got folks from the Avalanche Center that are gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, but does ARI, do you guys, I know I've seen other research on on kind of the correlation um, or relationship between folks that that are involved in avalanche um, avalanches, either, you know, 
triggered or, or buried or whatever um, versus their their avalanche training. Um, have you got, do you guys have recent studies of that or is that something you look at year to year? I think this year um, will be interesting. We we're we're at this like really exciting nexus of um, some of this is going to sound like I'm making an excuse of like organizationally growing to the point where we have technologically the tools to really look at the gigantic data set we have of people who have taken courses. Um, we've also reached a point where we have the ability to collaborate with a lot of the amazing work that's happening at Simon Fraser University in um, BC and um, beginning to be able to more regularly incorporate like input from the paper that the CIC put out about people's experience and involvement with avalanches. But that really is the million dollar question, I think, in like such a rich point for research that's really starting to take um, to gain some traction with academics is understanding like when we is backcountry or is avalanche education basically is it enabling or is it a good like public health preventative measure and um, it sort of depends on what kind of day I'm having, whether <laughs> like, how optimistic I feel about the world, whether I'm like, yes, we're doing good things or, oh no, we're just, we're just contributing to the problem. But I think that that is um, definitely a really exciting question that we are really being able to dig into. So that was kind of dodging it. No, no. I don't know, but it is definitely like all of that that's happening is on my radar and we're looking forward to being able to like figure out how we can incorporate that organizationally and then disseminating that through the, you know, the long game of telephone that we have. We take like expert information, we write curriculum, we train instructors and those instructors train people. So that sort of flow down does take, it takes time. Yeah, for sure. No, that's, that's, I appreciate a, an honest answer. And, and certainly I think if you do, you know, if, as that research becomes more available, if you're able to share it, you know, with us and we can distribute mm -hmm. to this group and, and that sort of thing, it'd be great to have a copy of your slides as well. So yeah. I will pass that on. Excellent. Well, Liz, thank you so much for, for taking time today. Um, hopefully you can stick with us for a little bit. So if other folks have, have questions, um, we can answer those later too. Will do. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, cool. Um, so next up, I have Brian from um, CAIC, from the Colorado Avalanche Information Center. Yeah, hi, Julie. Let me start my video here. Can you guys see me? Great. So Julie asked me to kind of talk about how the Snow Ranger program can interact with the Avalanche Forecast Centers um, so we can help each other, essentially. So I'm going to share my screen um, just to show a couple websites. That should show you like a current forecast, um, if you guys see that. Can you see that okay, Julie? Yep, looks good. Great. So obviously the forecast centers around the Western United States. And if I show you, this is avalanche.org and this will show you the avalanche centers around the Western US. Uh, we do have some, uh, we have the Mount, uh, we do have a forecast center in the East as well. So don't forget about the Mount Washington Avalanche Center, but the default view will take you to the avalanche centers in the Western US, which are indicated by these polygons uh, spread throughout the Western US. And you can see there's a avalanche warning in place here up in the, in the Washington state in the Cascades. So these avalanche forecast centers are putting out um, snowpack avalanche and weather conditions every day, along with associated avalanche danger ratings. And we all use uh, the North American Avalanche Danger Scale to communicate uh, the avalanche danger. So hopefully this information is useful for the, you guys that are out in the field, both from an avalanche perspective, but um, often depending on the avalanche center, you'll get really useful and timely uh, field observations and you'll get uh, up-to-date weather forecasts for remote and higher elevation mountain areas. Um, and so the best way really for you folks that are in the field to help and support and become kind of part of the avalanche forecasting process is to submit observations. Like if I just look at Colorado here, for example, um, that's a massive amount of avalanche terrain to cover. Um, so in the state of Colorado, we're a little bit different than the rest of the avalanche forecast centers in that 
We are not a U.S. Forest Service Avalanche Center. Most of the backcountry avalanche centers across the United uh, Western U.S. are either part of the U.S. Forest Service and they do backcountry avalanche forecasting only, um, or they're small nonprofits um, like uh, the one down here in New Mexico, for example, um, or Snowball down near Flagstaff. Uh, the Kachina Peaks Avalanche Center. Um, but most of them are U.S. Forest Service um, government agencies. We're in Colorado here, we're the state of Colorado. So we are within the Department of Natural Resources in the state. We do both backcountry avalanche forecasting and we do all the forecasting um, for our state transportation system. So all along all of our state highways. And then we work in conjunction with our DOT to do avalanche mitigation on those highway, uh, above those highway paths. And so we have a small staff of folks given that job. So, you know, we're a staff of around 20 folks or so, but you can see how much terrain we have to cover. Um, there's just no way for us to be everywhere all the time. And so it's really important and really valuable to get crowdsourced field observations from people that are in the field. And so when you guys are out in the field, um, if you can submit an observation to your local avalanche center, the forecasters would really appreciate it and find that information really helpful because like I said, we just can't be everywhere. And you don't have to be, um, you know, well-trained avalanche professional to submit observations, literally anything you see. Um, if you see cracking or collapsing, you see recent avalanche activity. If you see people uh, testing steep slopes and nothing happens, um, that's useful information for us. If you guys are out doing snow surveys, just height of the snowpack um, and how much that varies across the space is useful to us. If you have a little bit more training and you're able to identify and mention weak layers or send in snow profiles, that kind of stuff is incredibly helpful for us. Um, I'll show you how you can submit OBS uh, via our website, um, but all the avalanche centers are fairly similar. So if I just click on one of the zones, you can go to get the forecast, it'll pop that up. So you can see right at the top of the page, there's submit an observation. And that takes you to an observation page where you can just fill in weather, snowpack, and avalanche information. And then you can append any kind of media that you took. So whether that's from your phone um, or you drafted up a snow pit, for example. Um, some avalanche centers across the Western US also have apps that are for uh, Android and uh, iPhones. And I know for certain, you know, we've got one and the Utah Avalanche Center has one. I don't know off the top of my head uh, what other Avalanche Centers have phone apps, but I suspect there's more. Um, and you can submit Avalanche observations directly through your phone app. So I would suggest, especially if you're, you know, here in Colorado, just download the CAIC app onto your phone and you could simply just like take a picture. It'll geotag where the picture is and hit submit. And even if you're not in cell phone coverage, that'll come through as soon as you get back into range. So that just makes it uh, really easy to share information with us. And that kind of information is really important and it helps us make better forecasts essentially. Um, in terms of uh, you know the messaging we're putting out, uh, Liz talked about some of that, uh, but we do push a lot of people towards um, education. And so when we get, we get, inundated with media requests and spend a lot of time talking to them. And we take the same approach that it sounds like Liz at Aerie is taking in that there are five get the points in the Know Before You Go program, but when we're talking to media, we keep it short and we focus on getting the forecast so you know about current conditions, uh, making sure they're carrying the appropriate minimum rescue gear. So beacon shovel probe, and then we at that point emphasize that it's always safer to travel with a partner. And then we follow that up with uh, get the training. So that's where we push them to recreational avalanche courses like the ones that ARI is offering. Um, we do provide education services here at the CAIC. We try not to compete uh, with the private sector. So we try not to compete with area course providers. So mostly what we do is general awareness programs. We run the Know Before You Go program for the state of Colorado. 
Um, and so we'll do stuff at the very beginning entry level end. And then we tend to do uh, things at the other end of the spectrum, which is uh, continuing education for professionals. But we do provide specialized training for groups like the Snow Rangers. We do a lot of training for the Forest Service and Parks and Wildlife and things like that that may require specialized workplace training. So I wanted to point out here on our page anyway, another uh, resource is under education. We've got the Know Before You Go program. We also have a Know Before You Go to Work program where we train a lot of people that have avalanche hazards that they may encounter on the workplace. So this may be mines, uh, roadways, um, power companies, things like that. Um, and so we do a lot of training for industrial groups. Um, and then under our resources page, this is a great place where you can point people, but we essentially have a bunch of sections and we pulled this together and flesh this out a bit for this season because everything had to go virtual kind of due to COVID. So we wanted to make as much content available um, online for folks in one-stop shopping that we could. So you can see here on this page, you can go to how to find Avalanche training courses, which includes um, the ARI courses that Lids mentioned, how to use an Avalanche forecast, um, some online resources for Avalanche training, which includes some of the modules that Liz uh, talked about from area, along with a bunch of others from Avalanche Canada, the National Avalanche Center, and, uh, and other groups that have put together some really good information. Um, around Colorado, you can also request um, Avalanche safety signs or brochures. So we've worked on a lot of different signage, um, which started with Avalanche safety signs that went into all the backcountry HUP programs, but has evolved into a lot of trailhead signs and beacon checker signs. Uh, throughout the state of Colorado. We've worked on redesigning those, making them all consistent. So the Forest Service groups um, and a lot of the counties have asked for these signs and we've got you know, well over 100 now scattered throughout the state. So if you guys are interested in any signage um, for your area or avalanche safety brochures, um, you can just contact me and we can provide you that stuff. Um, and again, this resource page will have a bunch of material and it might just be useful for you to poke through and see if there's anything that you can use or if people are asking about avalanche information in any of these topics, uh, this should be a nice place to start um, to dig a little bit deeper. And I think that's all I had, but I'm happy to uh, talk about the season if anyone has got any questions or, or, any, or anything else. Great, thanks Brian. Brian. Yeah. Um, yeah, folks want to throw questions into the chat. Um, what I'm wondering, can you just walk us through sort of a, a day in the life of a forecaster? And, <laughs> yeah, and, and maybe I'm sure it's different day to day, but um, yeah, just even understanding kind of what it is they're doing, how they decide kind of where to go and, and yeah, can you walk us through that? Yeah, so there's a lot of different versions of the day in the life. Um, like depending on what you're doing for that day. But in, in general, our operation starts work at about four in the morning. And so we have a main kind of dispatcher quarterback for the team for the day, um, who then is working on a weather forecast for 10 different locations or regions around the state of Colorado at 11,000 feet. And so these are kind of handcrafted forecasts for areas that don't receive as much attention from the National Weather Service because they're in remote locations. It's where people are going to backcountry recreate. And then we provide for, point forecasting for all of our state transportation corridors um, that goes to the seat out of the Department of Transportation. And then starting at around 530, who's ever forecasting for that day, and we've got forecasters with primary responsibilities. So some folks are primarily responsible for forecasting for backcountry avalanche conditions. That's largely what you will see as a public consumer. And then we've got a whole nother uh, group of folks that are primarily focused on forecasting and avalanche mitigation work for the highway system. But we start because we're all over the state um, with a Skype chat at 5.30 and we run through our morning forecasting process, which includes reviewing all of the relevant observations that we've collected both as a team that have come in from various professional groups like guide groups, ski patrols, that kind of thing. We code all this data in and clean up our field observations. And then we have a group discussion on what people are thinking about for today's avalanche forecast. So what kind of danger ratings do we think we need? And we work off uh, for the backcountry, one giant um, kind of 
Google sheet that we can all work on collaboratively. So I can see what my other forecasters are doing. Um, and then we have um, a separate chat for, and a sheet for all the highway mitigation that's gonna be going on or is planned. We discuss thresholds for lowering or increasing the danger. Um, and then we work on our Avalanche products, um, which includes MP3s, because a lot of the local radio stations just play um, about a one minute description that we that we put out for northern central and southern mountains and then we forecast for all of our backcountry forecast zones and write our avalanche discussions which digs a little deeper that process is wrapped up uh, completely by about eight o'clock in the morning and then we coordinate where we need to do field work so we address where we've got data gaps both in the terrain um, and what questions we have as a team, like what do we need to know? Do we need to know if, uh, you know, the crusts on Southeast aspects are still re reactive or, and things like that. So we coordinate and then target our field work. People go out into the field and do their field work. Um, the main forecaster for the day stays in the office, which is my role today. So playing dispatch and monitoring the radio and uh, coordinating with everyone in the field, keep an eye on the folks that are in, make sure they get out safely. People that come back then write their PM reports, so their field reports for the day. And then we largely wrap it up, although we do have a forecast discussion Skype chat, which seemingly never ends. So it does go on whenever people have got thoughts and there's always someone to talk to, it seems like. So that's kind of what our day looks like. Um, although we do engage in a lot of um, education events and so we'll do stuff with outside groups, we do um, provide support for search and rescue groups if search and rescue requests help in, uh, in, in missions that are going into avalanche terrain we provide help where we can uh, we of course conduct all accident and uh, investigations throughout the state so sometimes when there's incidents and accidents that consumes a bit of our time and over the last many you know, several years here we spend more time trying to push our message out via social media platforms and so we now have a shift uh, so there's a, one person designated kind of per day who takes on the social media shift to try to get stuff out through twitter instagram facebook um and we you can reach a lot more people doing that despite um how, despite how a lot of us feel about social media it's a good way to reach a lot of people um so i think that covers most of it yeah did i leave any anything else out Julia? that's incredible no it's it's great to know how much goes into that forecast right because a lot of times i think we we just see what's on the website or on the app and and it's yeah there's there's obviously a yeah, lot it's of a ton of work i mean and the good you know a good forecast distills all of this information down into a simple and easy to digest information so it just to link it back to what liz was talking about you need to use your forecast to make, you know, good trip plans given the current condition. And so the forecast needs to be uh, simple enough that even the uninitiated user can use it effectively and yet provide enough detailed for even the seasoned professional uh, to increase their knowledge base for what's going on right now. Totally. Yeah, there's an art in, in finding that balance. And I will say, um, I forgot to point out one thing, but maybe I'll share really quickly. Um, even if you're not uh, going to the avalanche or reading the forecast, our under observations, you can go to our weather stations page. And we have a list of hundreds of weather stations, depending on where you're going, at high elevations. And um, you can use this as a resource. So, and if you click on the name, you'll get both graphical and data displays. And then we, of course, we also run our own models, weather forecasting models. So if you go into the forecast weather, you can go to, uh, this is the forecast that we put out each day, the zone weather forecast, and then there's model forecasts, and you can run your own models. So we run the WERF and the high res WERF, the NAM and the GFS, and you can look at all these different parameters. So if you wanted to look at, oh, um, like, let's say, say total snow over the forecast period, you can take a look and just start kind of looking at various models um, if you want to dig into the data. That's awesome. That's a great, yeah. great resource to have. Um, we do have a question from David. What are the high level AVI awareness pieces that you would like to see snow rangers and trail hosts sharing with recreationists in the field? Um, is that referring to like talking points or um, 
Is like what 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 message would you like to get them out? I think that's probably the question. Yeah, I mean, I think if you're running into people in the field, it's asking them if they've read the forecast for the day, and if not, at least to be able to give them that information, even if it's just the top level danger rating. Um, and it's always helpful to ask people if you know they realize they're in or going to avalanche terrain. Some people, like Liz was saying, are just on their snowshoes or out there and under, are unaware of the risk. So if you see people that might be taking a risk and unaware of it, it's always good to point out that like, hey, you know, this route or this trail or this road goes underneath avalanche terrain and things like that. And just ask them, you know, if they're carrying the appropriate gear. So a beacon shovel probe and are they traveling with a partner? So it's really those get the points. It's like, have you checked the forecast? Are you carrying the right gear? And if you want to continue to do this, you should probably get some training. Great. Does that answer your question, David? Yeah, that's great. Exactly what I was wondering. Awesome. Great. Um, well, I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat box. Um, sorry, I'm gonna keep myself unmuted. <laughs> um, um, I want to, yeah, thank you, Brian, for, for taking time to, to chat with us today. It was super um, helpful, um, even just for my own knowledge. Just, yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll, um, I know we just had a conversation with our snow rangers last week about making those, those observations a regular part of their day. I think it was happening episodically in the past as they would see something maybe out of the ordinary, but just every single day, you know, whether they're seeing something slide or or something not slide yeah and i know people can feel intimidated submitting observations to your avalanche center um because there are a lot of professionals that are submitting observations but you need not be some kind of snow nerd to submit observations you can use plain language uh simple norman normal conversational language and just tell us what you saw even if it's i didn't see any signs of instability or the snowpack was about a meter deep where i went today um, that kind of information is super helpful as well Awesome. Great. Well, thanks again, Brian. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so next, um, we'll shift to Jeff um, from the Colorado Search and Rescue Group. Um, he's going to talk to us a little bit just, yeah, about what, what the SAR groups do here and how our snow rangers and, and folks in this field can, can communicate with those groups. Thanks, Julie. Can you hear me? Yep. We got gotcha. you. Great. Um, yeah, it's great to see so many people on here. Uh, a number of you have heard me talk before, um, but hopefully I can bring everybody up to speed. One of the things that is has become quite obvious for search and rescue um, over the last couple of years is how little people understand what search and rescue actually is and what we do. Um, and so uh, what I'm looking for here to some degree is just some basic background information for all of you so you can help educate everybody else uh, because the public has no idea what we do um, they expect they call 911 and something happens and they expect that they have to pay for it or their insurance will cover it and there's, there's all kinds of, of details that go into uh, search and rescue and i could talk for hours and hours and hours so i'm going to try to keep this this relatively short and give you guys time to to ask questions um, and recognize that um, things are going to be a little bit different state to state. So I'm going to talk primarily about Colorado. Uh, but if you have questions about other states, I'm, I'm happy to see if I can help out. Um, so real quick, search, uh, Colorado Search and Rescue Association, uh, our members are the search and rescue teams uh, across the Colorado. It's about 50 teams, uh, about 2,600 volunteers. So by and large, search and rescue is volunteer other than in the national parks. And uh, kind of big round numbers, uh, there's about 500,000 hours put in by our volunteers every year in, in Colorado. The number of calls just keeps going up. And uh, this year, uh, COVID has, quite frankly, it's killed the teams, um, not literally, but, um, you know, teams are reporting a 300% increase in calls. Um, and so for volunteers to get out of work, that many times. So here I, I'm in Boulder. Um, we have, there's three SAR teams here combining the three SAR teams. It's about 300 calls a year, right? And, and say, hey, let's get, get out of work 300 times a year. It's not going to happen. Uh, so what we have in Colorado, what we have across the United States, at least Western United States, is an unsustainable search and rescue system. 
right now we're, we're doing all right. We're surviving um, and we're responding to all the calls, but um, we know it's headed in the wrong, the wrong direction. Um, and, and we're working with the legislature here in Colorado and, and talking to the feds about how do we make this work? Because this is a, a public service that's provided to anyone, uh, anytime there's an emergency. Um, and in all reality, uh, the outdoor rec economy um, relies upon us as do lost kids and lost Alzheimer's patients and suicidal individuals, you know, whatever it might be, we're going to go help them. Um, and so um, it's great that we're uh, forming these connections with all of you to make all of, make our job a whole lot easier. Um, so part of that has been a, a push by uh, a huge number of, of entities across Colorado um, including Department of Natural Resources, um, OREC, uh, Department of Tourism, um, and, and pretty everybody in the industry. And we have, actually I'll put it in the, in the chat here, um, developed a winter backcountry safety uh, website for everybody to go to. And there's a lot of, of kind of clearinghouse of information here. Uh, if you scroll down towards the bottom, there's a, a bunch of links. Um, and that's really the information to get out to the general public. A lot of that's on there and, and you've heard it all before, you know, get, get educated, uh, get some experience, go with a mentor, uh, hire a guide, uh, carry the right equipment, look out for other safety, know the, the avalanche forecast, know the weather forecast, right? All this kind of stuff, um, which you probably all know. Um, but recognize there's a different side to all of this, which is search and rescue, right? So, so the, uh, if an accident happens, if, if somebody is lost or overdue, if somebody is caught in an avalanche, if somebody is injured, um, there's um, this whole army of people that come in to assist with those situations. So uh, in Colorado, at least, each sheriff in each county is responsible for the coordination of search and rescue. All of the mountain communities have at least one search and rescue team. And um, when a county is overwhelmed by either the, the number of calls or the complexity of, of one large incident, they will call Colorado Search and Rescue, right? We're again, a nonprofit, all volunteer, and we help out these sheriffs of these counties get resources. And so one of the big pieces here is for Search and Rescue, there really is no backup for us. We are our own backup um, and we share resources across the state. Uh, but that also means that response times can get can get uh, rather lengthy um, if we have to go further. Um, also recognize that um, we also work very closely with coroners. We end up with a fair number of deceased individuals um, and that will change the game um, quite a bit if you happen to be on scene with a deceased individual. Uh, we know how to deal with all of that. Um, but just know that that's going to probably uh, dramatically increase the time that we're asking people to stay on scene um, for something like that. So um, without diving into details on dead people too much, um, let's talk about uh, the different types of incidents that you might run into. Uh, so obviously we've already been talking about avalanche quite a bit. If you uh, are out and you, uh, an avalanche is reported to you, uh, don't wait for search and rescue, as you hopefully all know. Go deal with the problem as best you can. Call for search and rescue as fast as you can, um, but that's going to be a, a judgment call on your part, whether you call or do a, a transceiver search, which comes first. I don't know. It's going to be your your uh, your decision to make. Um, if you obviously don't have cell phone coverage, you're going to make you're going to do the transceiver first first transceiver search first. Um, and get anybody uh, below the snow to be above the snow um, uh, to the degree you can. Um, also recognize that once you do call search and rescue, what we do is fairly different from companion rescue, right? We're going to bring in a lot of resources, a lot of specialized resources, um, and a huge number of people. And um, it, it's not going to look the same way you would expect a companion rescue to work. Um, and so I'm sure we'll, the, the various different SAR teams might ask you to fill in and, and assist as you can or, or, you know, any bystander to assist. Um, and you'll have to work that out with the local SAR team and the, and the situation at hand. Um, but recognize that we want to know what well, we know, hey, an avalanche occurred. 
the avalanche danger is whatever it might be. It, it's, it's heightened because something has already happened. We're paying attention. Um, as Brian has talked about with the, with the forecast and with CAIC, we know what, what the conditions are, um, but we need access and we need to figure out how, what's the best way, what's the safest way to access that location. Um, so things for you to think about. We also might be flying helicopters in there. And so to think about, oh, where, where might a landing zone be for an avalanche? Uh, we might be bringing in um, avalanche dogs, which means uh, keep uh, extraneous, obviously you go search the, search the, the scene, but um, try to keep packs and um, food and don't urinate, don't defecate on the, on the debris, uh, get that off the debris so that we're not uh, messing up the dogs too much. Um, so real brief on an avalanche there. So lost party. So you get a report, you're out and you get a report that somebody's lost, somebody's overdue. Um, you're going to get asked a lot of questions. So where were they last seen? What's their description? Right? What clothing were they wearing? Or male, female? Um, you know, uh, everything you can think of from a description standpoint. What, what type of equipment were they on? Um, so um, what equipment do they have? And, and this is their snow travel equipment. It might be a snowmobile. It might be um, a snow bike. It might be snowshoes. It might be skis, a split board, whatever it might be. Do they have skins if they're on, on the appropriate thing? Um, and then also water, shelter, heat, light, navigation equipment, and communication. Right? Those, those are pretty important things for us to know about whether these missing people have that and to what degree they have those, those types of, uh, of gear. Uh, what experience do they have? And then contact information for not only the, the missing party, but everybody else associated with this. We want to be able to call back anybody and, and, and pick their brain and, and figure out if these people got out some other way and contacted them. Uh, we need contact information. Um, and then uh, a rescue, right? It happens uh, all the time. Every day in Colorado, somebody is being rescued. Um, you know, it's maybe a, a simple distal leg injury, an ankle, a knee. Uh, maybe it's a head injury. Maybe it's a, a really a hurry up situation. Um, and I'm not going to be able to go through, hey, th this is a decision tree. This is what you need to do. I don't know all of your medical training. Um, but you're always going to run into a question of, do we move somebody or do we wait where we are? And to, to play these scenarios out and think about these while you're out there, right? How long is it going to take you to get to that location? Well, we might be able to cut that down. If you're, if you're on skis and we're on snowmobiles, we might be a fair amount faster if we know how to get there. Um, and so a snowmobile egress might be the best thing, um, but recognize snowmobiles probably can't go everywhere. And it, it takes a while to put in a snowmobile track. Um, so what is the right thing? Can we, can we shelter in place? Can we keep people appropriately warm and, and sheltered from the environment? Uh, great, if you can do that, um, if that's the appropriate thing. But so think through that. Uh, so, the other thing that you all need to think about is how you're going to communicate information out to us, to, to the sheriff's office, and recognize that ranger districts and county boundaries don't line up, and you might make a phone call and jump over one county to another county, and you're trying to report, or this happens on the front range all the time here, where somebody's in Boulder County and they make a phone call and it goes to Larimer County or Gilpin County or Weld County out on the plains, and uh, to get the dispatcher who answers the call to say, hey, I'm in Boulder County, can you transfer me to Boulder, um, is gonna, gonna make things a whole lot faster. Um, and then the biggest piece of information that we need is location. If you get us, nothing else, get us location and we'll get people to that, that area and figure out what's going on. Um, but after location, how do we recontact you? And then a brief report. Right, we don't, we don't need to know every last thing. We don't need to know how many, uh, the size of the facets in the area, right? We don't care about that. Uh, we'll figure that out if we want it. Um, we need to know, was it an avalanche? How many people were buried? Uh, when did it occur? Um, and who's on scene, right? Really brief type stuff. Um, and then we need to contact the reporting party. If that's you, that's great. If it's somebody reporting it to you, we need to get a hold of them. So don't let them go. Um, if they need to leave, get cell phone numbers so we can contact them back. Uh, um, and then, you know, response takes a long time. 
right? We're driving from wherever or we're flying from wherever uh, to get there. And it, you know, it's, it's not something that's gonna happen immediately. It's not an ambulance driving down the street to your house. Uh, we have uh, a fair amount of time to get to you. Um, expect that, prepare for the long haul. Don't overexert yourself. Um, take the time to, to make sure everybody is staying safe from the environment as well as you know, able to deal with the situation. Um, and I, I've talked about helicopters a few times. I just wanna go into that real briefly. Um, don't expect them. Flying in the mountains is super dangerous. Uh, flying in the mountains at night is even more dangerous. Uh, we have high winds, we have erratic winds, uh, we have precipitation, we have icing issues, especially in winter. Um, you know, if we can fly, we will. We'll use an air ambulance uh, if we can, if it makes sense, but you don't get to make that call. The sheriff and the search and rescue teams get to make those calls, um, and that's going to be based on safety in the, in the situation. Um, recognize that um, if we can fly, that doesn't mean we can land. And we, or we might have to land a long way away. And so uh, you might see a helicopter flying overhead and it just can't get to you. That's the way the situation is. Um, if we do drop people off, uh, they're gonna have some, some uh, ground time to figure out how to get to you um, and just recognize that's the case. Hopefully we can, we can land right near wherever the, the incident is. Um, and so I'm not gonna try to teach you how to land a helicopter from the ground without communication uh, right now, but uh, stuff to pay attention to and to think about if you are out there, you are considered the, the expert, um, you might need some additional uh, training to assist with all of these things. So on that note, um, you know, search and rescue teams are always looking for experienced people. Um, and, you know, depending upon where you are in Colorado, uh, the county might have 500 people as a total population, and that's what they get to choose from for their search and rescue team. So if you live in those counties, um, and you have experience and strong lungs and strong back and strong knees, um, it'd be great if you have time to help out and, and join the local team. Uh, teams with higher populations, you know, the, they are um, volunteers, but they're full-on professional big teams uh, with all kinds of processes. Um, and so that's a, a different, a different uh, situation if you want to join one of those teams. But still, reach out if you have time and, and the ability. Um, also, um, if people are interested, I'll throw, in, I'll throw our website in the chat here. Um, we're working on this website. Uh, in the next couple of days, we'll have information up on, on how best to join all of the search and rescue teams. But um, there's a, also a bunch of information on here uh, for folks if they want to want to figure some of this stuff out. Um, Julie, that was kind of rapid fire and a lot of information. Um, what else can I help with? That was, yeah, that was great. Jeff. Um, really helpful to get a kind of a sense, you know, for what the, the state of play is in, in Colorado specifically. Um, can you just talk a little bit more about how communication and, and the resource sharing between SAR groups happens and whether that's been been effective. I know you mentioned the, the need for more funding and I'm, you know, would encourage everyone on, on this call to, to certainly support um, any, you know, potential legislative changes that, that lead towards that. Um, but yeah, can you talk a little bit about just, just uh, yeah, how these agencies are working together um, or do they, do they stay pretty, pretty separate and, and distinct? Yeah, so it's going to depend on, on which county you're in. So uh, say Pitkin County, right? The, the Roaring Fork is uh, kind of in the winter, one way in, one way out. Um, and so they're not going to get a whole lot of help from Chafee County or Lake County on the other side of Independence Pass during the winter. Um, and so they know that and they don't ask for a whole lot of help. If they're reaching out for help, it's going to be to Eagle County or the Vale area um, or Garfield County um, or maybe down to Gunnison area. Um, but in general, the teams all work very, very closely. Um, I've probably personally been to half the counties in Colorado assisting with incidents. Um, and that's me as a, as a search dog handler. Um, and there aren't that many search dogs around the state. But um, we all have common radio frequencies. Um, and we get together and train um, annually. Uh, we have classes that we all attend together. Um, so uh, there's a lot of camaraderie across the teams. I know that I can go to any 
any community in, in the mountains, at least of Colorado, and I have a place to stay, right? I know members on all the teams um, were that kind of family. Um, and so um, it's, it's not an issue when you get on a border area where teams meet, you know, we, we meet on the Continental Divide all the time for Boulder County and Grand County, say, um, and they, they hop over the divide and help us and we hop over the divide and help them. Um, so and we're part, fully part of the emergency services network where, you know, fire and police um, are all working. Uh, we're fully uh, involved in all of that type of stuff as well. That's helpful. Um, and if folks have questions they want to put in the chat, um, I have another one just, you know, as far as these these snow rangers um, and these kind of positions and different programs that we have throughout the state, what are some things that they can do proactively to communicate with their local SAR groups and not, you know, not just be on the reactive side if an incident occurs, they, they obviously are communicating with you. Is there stuff they can do ahead of time? Yeah, definitely. So um, to reach out to your local SAR team. Um, you, you can Google them. We'll have it up on our website here in the next couple of days, like I said. But um, to proactively uh, talk and, and, and figure out who's the right people to talk to um, about various uh, different situations. Um, we have um, here in Boulder, we have the Brine Mountain Nordic Ski Patrol, and they do patrols up at uh, an area called Brainerd Lake. And we've gotten them some radios so they can contact us directly, right? They'll, they'll call dispatch and say, hey, we have an emergency, but then we'll jump on the radio and talk with them directly and not drain their cell phone battery. Um, and so that kind of thing, if you can share radios, uh, that might be helpful. Um, if you can talk about access and, you know, there, we all know about our own sneaky little access points. Search and Rescue knows about a lot of those as well. Um, but if we can cut down response by knowing about a different trailhead, um, also recognize, and, and there's been discussions already about trailheads, um, our response is going to be delayed by where we can park. And with COVID not being able to carpool the way we used to, we're going to bring even more vehicles up and snowmobiles and snowmobile trailers and, you know, all, all of that type of stuff. And so these packed parking lots greatly affect us. And, you know, if we have somebody who needs to be doing some kind of emergency response, but they have to park two miles down the road, response is going to be that much longer, right? And so if you're at a trailhead and you know that, that search and rescue is coming, if you have the authority through Forest Service or whomever to really shut down the trailhead and let, the, uh, let only search and rescue in and, and get as many open spots as you can, that would be super helpful for us to, to increase our or decrease our response time. Oh, that's great. Um, we've got a question in the chat. Is there a common radio frequency used or shared across the state by SAR similar to what the agencies use for wildfires? Um, yeah, so th that's an interesting question. Um, and to not go too deep in the weeds, there are essentially two radio systems used in public safety across Colorado. One's an 800 megahertz trunked radio system wh where I can jump on a radio here and talk to somebody in Durango um, some counties are using that primarily or, or, or uh, solely. Um, and then there's the uh, VHF radio frequencies that we've all been using for, for a long, long, long time. Um, if a county is on VHF, uh, there's a, a frequency called MRA1, uh, which is the standard one. It's 155.160. Uh, um, that's the, the frequency of it. And most of the teams are on that. Um, if you're if a county is on the 800 megahertz system, you can't get on that system unless you're in public safety. Um, and so you, that's not really an option um, unless you talk to your local folks to, to figure that one out. Does that answer it for Greg? That seems like, yeah, that seems like that was a great answer. <laughs> um, um, and you, you know, you alluded to this a little bit, but um, can you talk a little more about the, the COVID impacts and how that has changed your guys' systems and protocols? You know, and you mentioned carpooling as, as one. And um, yeah, can you talk to that a little bit yeah, more? Yeah, well, you know, as Liz alluded to, um, the backcountry um, has exploded. Backcountry use has exploded. Um, we all know this. And so from our standpoint, search and rescue teams, um, it started um, when COVID started and it has not let up. Um, we've just been getting call after call after call after call. Most team, many teams are reporting record highs um, 
for this year. And this is record highs after last year was record highs and the year before was record highs. Um, and so the teams are getting worn out, um, but also recognize that um, if we get a team that goes down, is quarantined or sick from COVID, um, we have to move people around and try to figure out how do we cover that county and how do we make that work? Uh, so we've been super protective of our um, of all the volunteers to to make sure that they um, are doing the right things uh, to protect themselves from COVID, uh, protect their teammates from COVID, and that's things like um, if we're doing a uh, litter carry where we're physically carrying somebody uh, by hand, it's one litter crew, and we don't swap people in and out. We just go for as long as it takes. We might have to take breaks, but recognize that if we're carrying somebody, that's six people, say, around a patient that we don't know, and we're within a foot of each other for hours and hours, right? We can't social distance. Granted, we're outside, um, and we have PPE on to protect ourselves, but we can't, we can't follow government mandates uh, to carry somebody out. And so we try to isolate the, those six people to make sure that they're safe, uh, but everybody else is safe as well. Uh, likewise, you know, if we're going to dig into an avalanche and, and be in a confined space with somebody where we're sharing, sharing the same air, uh, we're really concerned about, about COVID in those types of situations. We're going to do it and we're going to have PPE on to protect ourselves, but um, at the same time, we're going to be pretty concerned about that. Um, so um, it goes back and forth also from a, a command standpoint, right? We used to show up at a trailhead and, and have everybody pile into a truck or a, a trailer of some sort to, to run an incident. We can't do that anymore. We can't have those same people and that's that tight, those tight quarters. Um, so that means that we're working on new ways to, to run these incidents from a, from a logistics standpoint and a radio standpoint and have all the communication and briefings and whatnot. Um, so it, it's an involved complicated situation uh, for us. And what that generally means is things are just going to be slowed down a bit. Got it. Yeah, that makes sense. And I know it's been on, on people's mind and, you know, even from a, a risk taking standpoint and not wanting to get into those situations that require a, a SAR response. Um, especially. Yeah. And also recognize from a, from a recreation standpoint, we're looking at um, more people at all the trailheads. Uh, the potential for, you know, one group to kid a, kick a slide loose on another group, right? So it's not your uh, typical one person is buried in an avalanche. We might have multiple mass, cas mass casualty avalanches going on. Um, we might have multiple within the same county or the same range or across the state. Um, and so that's going to stress us dramatically in terms of what can we do? Where do we send our resources? How do we deal with this? Um, and um, for you all to just understand that's the situation and we don't have a solution for it. We also have the situation where the new people are probably gonna stay closer to the trailheads. They don't know what they're doing. Hopefully they're not too adventurous to get too far out, but the experienced people are gonna go further, right? They're gonna get away from the newbies and go have their, their their solitude in areas that are harder to access, um, maybe uh, not so well known. Um, and so we'll potentially have to deal with the, the accidents and the emergencies further back, which is fine from our standpoint. But then if you pile that on top of, you know, the, the quick uh, injured skier right off, you know, pick your pass, um, it just adds up a little bit more for us to, to have to deal with all that. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, well, Jeff, um, thank you so much for taking time to, to chat with us today. I'm not seeing any other um, questions in the chat, but it, I appreciate you providing your contact information. And um, yeah, we'll look for those updates on your guys' website it's coming soon. And yeah, hopefully all of the, the folks, in, at least in Colorado, can, can get in touch with their local SAR teams. Um, and I'm sure in California and elsewhere, they've got kind of similar programs set up, so. Yeah, yeah, and I think that proactive communication makes a big difference, right? You don't want to be meeting somebody for the first time uh, in the middle of the, the night um, when, when uh, uh, tensions are high and everybody's trying to move fast. Um, if you can take the time beforehand and, and go have a, a cup of coffee or a virtual cup of coffee um, and chat, that would be really good.